I've been involved in civil rights since I was 15 years old uh, and doing a whole lot of, uh, um, involved in a whole lot of different movements over the years. And then when I started practicing law, um, I did a lot of civil rights cases along with criminal defense work. Uh, and, and so uh, I'm speaking just from my experience, uh, but I have never been part of a movement that has been so, um, it's just, this is an amazing movement. I've never been part of a movement that's been so spiritual, that has been so, uh, feels so righteous, right? And all the movements that I have been a part, we were standing up for right things, but this one is elevated to a different point. Uh, and the reason why I think it's important, uh, at least from my standpoint, to, to uh, share my experience is because I see a lot of things that's going on in this movement that started way back when, before I was even born. And so we talked a little bit about COINTELPRO, uh, at the first class. And a lot of people don't know about COINTELPRO is because it's intentionally not taught in schools. And it's intentionally not taught in schools because the government doesn't want you to know that they had a persistent and consistent policy for almost 30 years or over 20 years of, of secretly trying to destroy nonviolent peaceful movements. And the only way that this came to, to light is in 1971, a group of young people believe that the FBI was using uh, its agents to secretly infiltrate nonviolent, peaceful movements to destroy them, to set the leaders up to go to prison on fake crimes, to basically uh, pit one leader against another, and to, to send in uh, infiltrators to pretend that they're part of the movement to destroy the movement and allow it to implode from within. So over the last few weeks, when I see what I've been seeing with the governor on TV, having a press conference and using media, to sh uh, fake media, to try to show and somehow uh, uh, link uh, all this stuff that we see on social media, closer to the mic, to link all the, my God, man, that's almost in my mouth. Is, it, is this close enough for you? Hey, look, look. But when I see the governor doing these press conferences with the attorney general and other people from the state, and they're putting in, in, on the TV for the public images saying that somehow these people on this nonviolent front up here are responsible for the threats that they're getting without linking and having any evidence to it. When I see videotape of a police officer telling a, a, a young brother down there that, that somehow somebody up here is the reason why they went into that structure. And they know they lying to the young man, but they're trying to get him to, to come out and be uh, uh, violent, right? To somehow come out of Kapula Aloha and, and, and because they know. And what the government's trying to do is if I can get you to come out of that, if I can agitate you to the point where you will turn on one another, if I can aggravate you to the point where you'll start fighting with each other, then we can justify the National Guard. Then we can justify armed policemen coming in here and taking you out, and the public won't blame us. See, then we, we got the high road. And you go watch any NBA game, any NFL game, and you'll see players trying to agitate the other player. Now, you can't really see it on TV, but they whispering things about their mama in there, you know, your mama this, your mama. What they're trying to do is provoke them into a fight. And then you see the referee throw the flag. He don't blame the, the agitator. He's throwing out the person that, 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 that throws the first blow. And it's the same thing that's going on here. It was going on in the 60s. But let me get back to it. In 1971, a group of five or six people, they were young people, they said, you know what, we believe the FBI is trying to destroy uh, these civil rights nonviolent movements. And so what they decided to do was there was an FBI office in a city called Media, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. And they weren't in no big structure building. The FBI had offices that continued to all over the nation. This office was in some type of uh, structure where you, they just rented an office. So it wasn't too hard to infiltrate. And they waited. These, these groups of uh, young people waited until the Ali Frazier fight. Muhammad Ali had been uh, banned from fighting when he stood up and said, I'm not going to be inducted into your illegal war. Ain't no Vietnamese person ever did anything to me. They ain't called me nigga. They ain't done nothing to me. My enemy's over here. Say, so, hey, when Ali said, everybody like Ali now, but when he was down there standing up for his rights and for a lot of our rights, he was the enemy. 
He was the agitator. He was the one stirring up trouble. He's what they calling you now. And so when he got his right to, to fight again back, his first fight was against Joe, uh, 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 Frazier, right? It was against Joe Frazier. And they knew everybody was going to be watching that fight in 1971. So these young people said, hey, what, the, day, the night we're going to break into the FBI office is going to be the night that Ali fight Frazier. And all the agents are going to be watching the fight. And they broke into the office. They stole all these records, right, showing J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, telling his agents, come up with ideas to destroy the, 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 the uh, civil rights movement. Come up with ideas to, el to eliminate Dr. King. What you think eliminate means? They, they use the word neutralize. We need to neutralize Dr. King. Now, if you know anything about Dr. King, how was he ever a, a threat to be violent in, in this country? He wasn't. He wasn't. But see, everybody didn't believe it. So, see, you know, when you talk about your government spying on you, when you're talking about the United States government being complicit in, in making up stories to get people wrongfully convicted and sent to prison, when you talk about the FBI and your government or the United States government, I ain't going to say your government. I have my own opinion. I have my own opinion about that. I can't, you know, I can't say that. Because right? I don't believe it's your government. And that ain't no theory. You know, hey, y'all gonna get me distracted. <laughs> Look, that, that, that's, not, that's not a theory, right? We, we, I gotta say this and I'll get back on point. So some brothers, they took me over, I was on a bit, they, some, some Native Hawaiian brothers, they look, we, we see some of your videos, we, we kinda wanna educate you to some of our history. So I went out and met with them and they showed me that thing that President Clinton had signed in, in 19, what was that, 93? Right, so as a, as a criminal defense lawyer, I'm reading that, and I'm like, this is a confession to a crime. This, this is not an act of, okay, whatever, you know, I mean, because it was a legis whatever it was, some type of legislative act, right? It's a confession. I mean, if I went down and admitted that I robbed you, right, and I gave you step by step how I robbed you, <laughs> right, and then at the end of my confession, you ain't making me pay for it. See, it's one thing for me to say, yeah, I stole your stuff, and then I ain't giving it back, right? And it's not so much about I'm sorry, it's how do you make it right? Okay, you just confessed that you committed a crime against us. Okay, that's fine, but I don't want to hear all that. How are you going to make it right? It's almost like, you know, I steal your automobile, you come to get it back, I done got the title changed into my name. I, hey, I'm sorry I got your car. I'll see you later, right? I mean, right? Ain't that the same thing? Now, see, you say these things and people think that you're crazy. And so back then in 1971, when people were saying, you know what, the U.S. government is, is, is treating its own citizens as terroristic threats, that they setting up their own innocent citizens to be killed, people would say, you're crazy, man. You're a conspirator theorist. And so these young kids broke in. It's like, y'all think we crazy? We're we going to prove it. They broke into the office. They collected thousands and thousands of documents. They carried them out in briefcases. Right outside. The, and then they, they went back. They put on gloves so that their fingerprints wouldn't be on the papers. And they made copies. Right? You know how hard, because back in 71, Xerox wasn't really making no fast machines. That's what I know of, right? And so they made copies, so none of their fingerprints would be on it. And then they sent it to the media, and the government found out. And the government told the news media, if you print any of it, you're going to be charged with espionage violations because these documents are national security. And the only media that printed it, go back and look this stuff up. And those, you know, you got some TMT pro supporters and all that those are going to be watching this video saying Lawson up here talking trash. I come with receipts. <laughs> right? I mean, I do. Right? I, and so I'm like, you know, go look it up, man. The, 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 the only one that, that, that printed it was the Washington Post. And Washington Post told the government, you ain't going to threaten us. They printed it, and that's when it got shut down. But if you go back and look at those documents, I'll post them online later on when I get back to Oahu. Now, you go read that stuff, man. I mean, they, they're sitting there, and who was telling them? 
come up, he, the, he, he says it's facts about what's going on don't matter. Come up with good lies that will make them look bad. That we need to, 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 to uh, send out leaflets that, that, that will divide the black community against itself. Now, I don't know, but I thought I saw something about leaflets being distributed throughout the state of Hawaii lately about pro-TMT and, 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 and being antagonistic to the protectors here. Right? And so all these things, and so they ended up getting Black Panthers killed. A young man named Fred Hampton was 21 years old, and, and the Panthers, you know, they wanted to give the image of the Panthers being violent. The Panthers was, was a, was a non-violent movement. They truly were. They believed in, in self, they believe in arming themselves. The same way you see some of them people down in Texas and all that talking about don't come for our guns. See, when it was, when it was, uh, when it was black folks wanting to carry guns, then it became a problem. But the point is, they were nonviolent. And Fred Hampton was in Chicago. He was 21 years old. He was making, he was getting together the poor Appalachian whites. He was getting together the Chicanos. He was getting together the Native Indians, right? All to come together in one massive movement. And they had an informant go inside his house. And the documents is in some of the ones I passed out. And they had the informant sketch for the agents every room that was in that house. So that when they busted through the door, they wouldn't know where to go. And the informant sketched the house, and the sketch is, is attached to those documents I bought earlier. And then they took, he took it back to the agents. The agents also knew that the Black Panthers stayed armed, right, in self-defense. And so they kicked in the door at 1 or 2 in the morning, they shot that man dead while he laid next to his pregnant wife. And then they blamed him and said the reason why we had to kill him is because he was in there with guns. An investigation later on, years later, showed that they murdered him. Right? And this is what, and this is what COINTELPRO does. And when they sent that officer, uh, the videotape I just saw, that my brother's going to talk about, where the officer goes down and tries to tell one of the protectors, Hey, they up there, they, somebody up there in your own camp is setting you up. When we went down there to destroy it and to tear up that building that was built, we were told that you was back in there with a gun and some kids. And that's why we came in the way we do. See, that's the government trying to get somebody up here killed. And you go back to Standing Rock. Many of you remember Standing Rock. These same tactics was used in Standing Rock. Go look it up. I, like I said, I come with receipts. The oil companies and them hired a private security firm called Tiger Swan. Now, I don't know, but I read something about uh, a private security firm being paid millions here. But Tiger Swan was a private security firm, and their specific goal was to infiltrate the movement, to create fake leaflets, to monitor social media and create fake social media, and then make it seem like uh, uh, some of the stuff, that the threats and stuff was coming uh, against the oil company was coming from the, the, the nonviolent people at Standing Rock. And they got busted. They got busted because somebody on the inside sent all these documents out. Somebody that was with some of these contractors said, this is wrong. And they disclosed this to the public. I mean, they were sending drones over uh, the camps and stuff like that, uh, spying on people, putting people in there to infiltrate the people, illegally tapping telephones. Right? If there's law enforcement already here on this island, and if you have a lawful right to build TMT, why do you need to hire private security way before this even happened? Right? Now, I don't know, but it needs to be looked into. And so the reason why I say this, all that to say this, it's easier to remain in Kapu Aloha when you know what they're doing to you. What happens is, again, because the whole game is come out of it, get angry, lose your temper. It becomes easier to know and be, and because you know why it's coming, right? It's th when things happen in my life and I don't understand it, that's when I'm in fear. But if I know why certain things are going on that are happening to me, the fear is lessened. Now I understand it. And, and the reason why I think it's important for us to, to, to educate each other because I learn more from you when I come up here than you ever learn from me. Trust me on this. I've learned more uh, 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 about uh, my Native Hawaiian brothers and sisters. I learned more about some of the reasons why you had to sit down and stand up on this road. Because, again, a lot of stuff that's going on is being gaslit 
I, I mean, like I said over there, they don't even, they, they don't know what, they can, look, they can't, they came on here in July and arrested the Capona and claimed that somehow they blocking the road and we all know they don't even know if they even have jurisdiction on this road. And the reason why we don't know that is because last month, the AG and them issued a whole report talking about and trying to explain why they have jurisdiction over this road. Now, I, I, I done done criminal law for years. I ain't never had to have the police tell me, explain to me why it is they got jurisdiction unless you're really not sure. Think about it, because it wasn't until people started pointing out, hey, y'all ain't paid the bill. The deal was underneath that 1994 act was that we will, you can purchase the land. Here's the offer, here's the deal. But if any of, these, any of this is not consummated, if any of this is reneged on, all deals are off, right? And so they don't have jurisdiction to, to come right on this road, right? Like I said before, you go, go lay on your driveway at your private home and block the driveway. The police can't come and arrest you because they ain't got jurisdiction on your driveway. So again, if you ain't got jurisdiction to arrest me, if you have no legal right to put your hands on me, then you kidnapping me when you take me. If I take one of y'all out of here saying y'all blocking the road and I ain't got no right to do it, you think I, right? I, I'm kidnapping you. you. I'm abducting you. Now they don't like that language, but what else is it? If you don't have a right to be here, because see, keep in mind, when the state brings a charge, they got to prove every element beyond a reasonable doubt. You won't have to prove nothing. You can sit there and not say nothing. All right, so now one of the things you got to prove is you have the authority to charge me with this. Show me the receipts on how you, own it, how you got jurisdiction on this road, because you got to prove it. I don't have to prove nothing. So judge, before we get into all this blocking stuff like that, uh, let me know that the police officers had authority to be on this road and enforce the law. Same way as they would need to show if they came and arrested you on your driveway. They ain't got, right, they can't enforce none of them laws, right? And so you make sure that you push them. Because then it comes down to uh, 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 them producing. If you can't, and again, if I'm standing on this road and I don't believe you had jurisdiction, state, and then you come out later, after I got arrested, trying to explain why you have jurisdiction. Isn't that evidence that you can't convict me beyond a reasonable doubt? Because you don't know. Right? The burden of proof is you have to show beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't even know. <laughs> right? So how are you going to convince me that I should have known? Right? I mean, you're telling me I should have known that I'm on a road that you don't own, and you're doing emails and memos explaining because nobody knows how you know that you know that you own this road. Yeah, y'all laughing. Hey, hey, but you know, I, we used to have fun. So when I used to rep, look, I, my law firm, I, I say this, so I didn't know no Hawaiian words when I was in Cincinnati. But any, any, any protester that got arrested in Cincinnati, we, my law firm, I, we, we represented them for free, pro bono. And pro bono is pono. See, that's what I know now, right? Pro, right? But I didn't know that back then. Well, I didn't know the word for it. I just knew it was right. Right? I just knew it was right. And so we would go in there, and, we, and, and we, we'd bring it. We'd bring every, every defense we could think of, we're going to bring it. You're going to prove to us. Because it wasn't just about what was going on here. It wasn't about some of the stuff we were standing up for in Cincinnati. It was about a, a whole bunch of mistreatment. And sometimes the only way to bring that pain out is to put my client on the stand and let them bring it. Right? And so why is it that you felt the need to stand on this road and protect that sacred mountain? And the question and the answer is because I ain't had no choice. The same reason why you would stand in between a machine gun and your baby. What else you expect me to do? What else you expect me to do? And see, they understand that if you go to Israel and say, we're going to infiltrate Mount Tabor where Jesus had his transfiguration, you get shot before you got halfway there. See, they, they will defend theirs, and under, and, uh, right? 
They will defend their sacred places. And then you're going to tell us somehow we got to compromise on ours, but you won't compromise on yours. And really what you're saying is that what we believe is less important than what you believe, right? And so it's to, and to me, the beautiful thing about this and the reason why I come here letting you know from my experience that they're going to continue to try to come is because it ain't just about here. They see a, a, a nation of people rising up. They have, I mean, it, it, right, this is one that they see a nation of people. And that was the reason why they went after Dr. King, right? I mean, really, they saw when he started, when Dr. King got out of, you know, when he started expanding the civil rights from just these, but to, to the unlawfulness of the Vietnam War. And when he got killed in, in, in Memphis, Tennessee, he was there about economic disparity. Why we don't make as much as they do. Why we incarcerated more than they are. And so when, they, when the government saw him rising up and the people rising up with him, white people, black people, it didn't matter. And they started seeing the issue was about being treated unfairly. And what they see here is a nation rising, a nation being re reawakened. And that's a threat. And you got to protect your leaders. See, the mistake we made in Ohio on this, is that they started infiltrating those organizations. And then you had the leaders fighting each other. Same thing that happened in, in, in uh, the civil rights movement, right? And, they, and, and because they were infiltrating that, they were fighting each other. Go back and look at the last election when Russia infiltrated all the social media, right? And started putting up fake social posts and media posts on Facebook. And we didn't know at the time it was Russia, but we fighting each other. And they sitting back way in Russia looking at us destroy ourselves. It's the same thing on a different level That's what's going on here. There was one post that, that the governor showed in that little um, um, video, that little fake news conference. Remember it had one that said there's a $5,000 reward for the officer that wrote, wore the mask. Remember that? And they made it seem like it was a bounty for his head, like he was somehow in danger. And if you read it, all it said was for his identification. There's a $5,000 reward for his identification. Now, why would you, trained in the law, get on TV and say this is a bounty? And if you don't read carefully and look carefully, it'll give you that twist, right? It'll give you that twist. And so a lot of this is about creating an image that individuals standing up here in a nonviolent, peaceful way are somehow violent. And when we have to go in and remove them, the public isn't going to be mad because we've conditioned the public to believe they too are violent, right? That's what's going on. It's gaslighting. And the beautiful thing about your movement is that back in the day, we, we were subjected to the TV. We were at their mercy. There was no social media. There was no real-time videotaping. There was no going live on Facebook. We were at the mercy of whatever they printed or whatever they put on TV, right? We're not at that mercy anymore. And so we can educate each other, inform each other, protect one another, and do it with, with Kapu Aloha, right? Because once they get us out of that, and that was the beautiful thing about that. I'm going to uh, stop and let the other brothers talk. But the beautiful thing about this, which was so different, is that to me, and I tell people all the time, I feel something spiritual when I come here. I feel good when I come here. And I come here because I like feeling good, right? And, and I come here to stand shoulder to shoulder with you all because there's something spiritual about being here. And you can't protect a spiritual place by doing unspiritual things, right? You cannot protect the spiritual mountain by doing unspiritual things. And the reason why the government keeps failing is because they engage in unspiritual activity. I mean, because really, back, I mean, if the police would have told a lot of young men what they told him, because when I, back in, 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 in Cincinnati, when the riots erupted and the protests that we were doing, it was four days of riots. They brought in the National Guard. They, I mean, the Molotov cocktails were flying at the police. I mean, it was crazy for four days. The reason why they erupted is because the young brothers could not stay in nonviolent, peaceful obedience. They just could not do it, right? Because, I mean, I was young too, so hey, I understand it, man, right? But here's what's different. A lot of young men that I, Right, would have got mad and came up here and started some stuff. They would have believed what that cop was saying. Yeah, man, they up there setting you up. They the ones that caused to come up here. But that's how you know this is spiritual, because he didn't, he didn't fall for it. When they came up here and saw that flag and had, do you really think that cop came out there with his mask already on, not knowing what they was going to do? They talked about sawing that flag in half before they left the police station. Because if, if, if it was any other way, they would have came up here 
the way they did, no mask on, they would have got up there and said, there's no other way in, which was some bull, anyway, that's, right, there's no other way in. But that's not what happened. He get out the vehicle with the mask on. He's been, he's involuntarily been ordered. That's what you're going to do. And you're going to cut that flag in half, and we're going to watch him jump. And then we're going to have everybody else prepared to go in and move him out. And then when the, when the young man didn't fall for it, and when, and when people stayed in Kapalua, over there, everything they tried has failed. Why? Because in every other part of the nation, when something like this is going on, it works. Why not here? Because I, I, you say, say I'm crazy, whatever. I'm just telling you from my own experience. Because I, when I used to do unspiritual things, it came back on me. So I learned this lesson the hard way, man. Very painful. I had many days sitting in the penitentiary thinking about my spiritual stuff. But the whole point is this, right? You cannot be engaged in spiritual warfare doing our spiritual things. And so just any, you know, they've been threatening some of us professors over there at UH, uh, and trying to intimidate our students by signing uh, waivers that you can't go over and learn on the mountain unless you sign a waiver of liability. If I get hurt over there, UH ain't liable. And I realize that when I go over there, I'm putting myself in the danger, I'm paraphrasing. Now, they don't require waivers anywhere else. See, we sent students down here when Trump declared an emergency order at the border, and there was immigrants being harassed at the border, and rightfully so. We sent students down there, and they, they didn't have to say, uh, uh, sign no waiver. We got students studying up there on the volcano. They ain't signing no waivers. And I tell them all, I tell them, hey, any, I'll tell you, hey, you can film it, it doesn't matter. Ain't none of my students going to sign that waiver. Because what student wants to be sit, signing up on a document where you, UH, has a vested interest in the money up there? See, we messing with UH's money. We messing with TMT's money. That's how they see this. And you in the way. So ain't got none of that. That's all this is about. But what student wants to sign that and then become on a list of people that was going against your university so we can remember you when you come up for your law license. We're going to remember you when you come up for that job. We may not get you today, but, you, but you're going to sign this waiver. And if you, don't require it to be, if you don't require that waiver to be signed anywhere else, if you allow me to go teach the same things about wrongful convictions and people getting set up all over the world, why are you telling me I can't go here and teach it, especially to a community that needs to know it right now? Why is that a problem? So then you ain't got a problem with me teaching a subject. You got a problem with who I'm teaching it to. And that ain't my problem. <laughs> right? You got a problem with me and you want to bring it. I got to tell them, hey, I know how to go to federal court. Because that's what we're going to end up talking about. We ain't going to talk about it in your office. We ain't going to talk about it at the U.S. president's office. We're going to talk about it at federal court. That's what, that, you know, and, and you go talk, right? Uh, I'm sorry, brothers. Yeah, come on up here, man. <laughs> okay, uh, and this is Maho. The only reason I'm standing here before the other one gets up, I'll give you a, a break. <laughs> I mean, these guys are strong when they get up here and talk, you know? But, and he's got to learn how to say kapu aloha. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to take uh, Hawaiian language classes next. Yeah. Yeah. But be patient with me. Well, it's killing me under the tent, man. Uh, but it's, 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 you've got to be thankful and grateful that we have that kind of message around. And he's able to speak to us, particularly in that tone. Yeah, because most of us uh, grew up in a house in Hawaii where there's two sounds in the house. One from your mother and the other one from your father. Okay? And so it's very encouraging to know that here at the Mauna, you have a presence of both of those particular sounds. Okay, you have our mothers up here, Makua Wahini, and you have the Makua Kani. And I think that says a lot about what he's saying about how well we're trying to do our best in getting this done. Okay? So it's going, to be a, it's going to be a very difficult way to get 
the two voices, your mom and your dad, in, into one sound. Yeah. So thank you for for trying to understand how possible that sound can be from a male. Yeah. But inside of this same person, there's that. Well, he decided that's very spiritual too, yeah? So, I love the guy. Yeah, I try to spend as much time as with him so that he doesn't come up here. <laughs> okay, pay attention to the next one because both of them are forceful. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys need more time between the two? Okay. <laughs> hey, hang, hang in there and uh, let, let them let them be them, yeah. Because we need we need men like that standing up for what our mothers were able to give us, and that's generations and generations of children, right? So hang in there and. It's not so much listening that bothers me, it's hearing what they're saying. So, you gotta pay real close attention, okay? Here's the other half of the drama. <laughs> oh, the fresh I get though, jeez, boy. Eta ho poatani, ei eta mauli ola, ei ola hoi, o mauli ola, ei ola ja o etani tumelono, oja, ho oja, ei ola. Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> okay. I don't even know where to start. But my brother Ken, you know what he shared, it's important to really understand the truth. To really understand who we are struggling against. And this is nothing new in Hawaii. There are many who have come to Hawaii to benefit off of our pain, our lands, and benefit by taking away from the future of our keiki. And we should always understand our parents, grandparents' generation, great-grandparents' generation, what was stolen from them was a crime. And many of us, my generation, parents' generation, we were the result of that crime. But the next generation, and the young ones and the ones to come, they will be the healing of that crime. See, that's what this whole thing is about. The great Malcolm X said, the biggest mistake is trying to organize a sleeping people. You have to first wake them up to their heritage, to the humanity, and then you get action. And through this history, in the last 30, 40 years, this was the rebuilding of what had been taken. And yes, you can say they took the land, but if we're really conscious, we all would realize they never take the land. Where is the land? As Brother Skippy always says, Papa remains under our feet. What was taken was our minds. What was taken was our hearts. And more importantly, what was taken was our spiritual connection to this place and one another. And through these last 30 and 40 years, we see the rebuilding of our Lahui, which encompasses all of this. Which brings us to this moment in time. This time. And as I've been saying, this is no different in history. This is the period of time, just like our Kupuna was in 1897. Just like in 1893. Just like in 1810. Just like in 1778. Just like to when the first canoes left. That same question was put to them. To Did they have the courage to do what was necessary? To do what is right. To bring forth a better day for the, for the future. For our people. So as Brother Ken has been sharing. In this struggle. We have to always be akamai and pay attention. 
That's quite Pune Prejean used to say. No worry about the chain on your legs. Worry about the chain on your brains. And as a man think it, so he does. It's really about the consciousness of our people. Raising the consciousness of our people, which destroys the fears, which puts away the confusion, and empowers the soul to do what is necessary. And we understand, we are struggling against a mighty, mighty foe. When we struggle against the TMTs, I say, we're not really struggling against the scientists up there or the telescope. Because in reality, they're the small players in all of this. They're the front. They're the excuse. We're actually struggling against those who are going to cash in over that telescope. Those who are looking to reward themselves and fatten their wallets. That's who we're struggling against. In fact, a UH professor just talked about it last week. We know it's a $1.4 billion, $1.4 billion project. It's a lot of money being put into this thing. Now, why would you put $1.4 million in a project? Can you imagine what they're looking to make out of it? The professor just talked about them making as much as $400 million a year. I want you guys to think about that. $400 million a year. And the research grants and all the side projects that they get going along, which are going to fatten the wallets. There are researchers that are going to make a million dollars a year. I repeat, a million dollars a year on that mountain. And they toss a million dollars, suppose it, to the Hawaiians for some kind of educational foundation a year. Are we that foolish? That's not even the scraps of the table. That's a grain of rice to fall off the table you're talking about here. So they're going to protect and they're going to fight hard to ensure they want to make that money. And it's the collusion of the politicians through the government who get their own greedy hands uh, through corruption. They speak the truth. Working along with these corporations and technology firms, construction firms, Fiber optic cable companies, power companies, so they all can get their own piece of the pie. And then you bring in the research element connected to the U.S. military, and they tell us, oh, this has nothing to do with the U.S. US military. You think we're that foolish? I can speak from Haleakala. I can tell you right now in Haleakala, same struggle. The Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope World's largest solar telescope right next door to the Department of Defense's most powerful telescope, the AOS, the Air Force Telescope, which tracks every man-made object in the sky. It's tracked from Haleakala. That is connected to the military's most powerful computer system, which is in Kihei, which is right next in the same building with the Pacific Tsunami Research Center. Mapping the world, right next to Oceanit. Who is Oceanit? Go check it out. Ocean is the largest Hawaii research company who do a lot of kind of research for the military. These are the ones that shoot the lasers in the sky and all that kind of stuff. Led by the person who's also the board of regent for the University of Hawaii who contracts their own company. Yes, they do. And I know I'm saying this. I don't take this lightly saying this, I'm brave and bravado. I know they're going to come. That's what they're going to do. But I know we hide in the darkness, we're never going to win. We must speak the truth and bring it to the light. And so even on Halea Cloud, when we struggle, well, we fought a mighty foe. They had homeland security involved. When I got arrested in 2017, I got taken into the back room. I already saw all the charges they already had on the board, all the contact numbers. And they were going to charge us with all this right. See, that's the new kind of language that they use. This new way of trying to charge us that we, we you know, 
We're trying to incite riot and violence. Of course, we never did any of that. But they already see us as so-called terrorists. They treat us in this manner. And how do I know? Because when I got taken to the back room, speaking with the arresting officers, those who run the Special Investigative Unit, Hawaiian Brothers, and they're talking to me and they say, Oh, Kalekoa, oh, we already knew that you knew. And so I'm playing along, yeah, 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 yeah. And it flashed back to me and I realized, hey, those guys in that room, I just saw them the week before. Because I had gone to do a talk on Oahu, La Ho'i Air, back in 2017. And after doing my talk, I sat on a panel with other brothers and sisters who were at Standing Rock. And we were talking about the similarities of Hawaii and Standing Rock at that time. Again, this is a week before the last arrest in 2017 for Haleakala. And I remember, and I looked up and I go, yeah, I remember that guy. When I was speaking, he had a camera up, filming me the whole time. I did not know I was under surveillance for two weeks. I want you guys to understand this. Two weeks I read at that point. Me? An educator? A father in the community? Coach soccer? Coach baseball? I'm a criminal? Yeah. I'm a criminal because I fight against the injustice of our people. But you know, our police, law enforcement brothers and sisters, there, they knew also. They told me straight. This was not they are doing. This came from way on top, as he said. So this is not a play game that we involved here. And I get challenged. I go to court. I get charged. Full misdemeanor. A couple of petty misdemeanors. But see, full misdemeanor allows me to have a jury trial, which I always wanted. Because see, I know our people, when people get presented the facts, I get more faith in the people out there than any of the judges. I'll tell you right now. So what do they do? They drop the full misdemeanor charges. Kaleko, you don't have a jury trial anymore. Now you just face the judge. I go to arraignment. Took three, four times in arraignment because I refused to speak English at that point. And I kept on saying, I will defend myself in Hawaiian. If I go down, I go down as full as a Hawaiian as I can. And so I had an interpreter provided for two or three of their initial meetings. In fact, they took me to all the different judges because they had all these conflicts going on also. Like five different courtrooms. And then I sat down with the prosecutor. Now, as you guys know, I'm also involved with other arrests also out there. And I was going to see the same judge that I saw two years earlier for the same charges again, which I had been found guilty earlier, right? And you already know it's going to be the same result. So I sit down with the prosecutor, a young Hawaiian woman, and I tell her, if you guys like make a deal, let's make a... I got two other court cases going on right now. I say, worried about... The, the Maui one, I wasn't really worried. I knew, you know, you could pretty much tell the writing on the wall with that one. So I was really worried about the other cases I had on Oahu at that time. And she leaves, and then she comes back, and she says, well, she talked to her bosses. And this is their offering. I gotta, I gotta plead guilty. That's the deal now. I gotta plead guilty. And I gotta take 30 days in jail. I told her, if they give me that 30, I'll I walk that 30 days in jail. I'll take it. But I ain't gonna plead guilty. I refuse to. Now, let me tell you, that's the maximum. They were asking me to plead guilty and take the maximum. In other words, what are they telling me? This to you, Kalekoa. That's what they're telling me. And then she tells me, and uh, Mr. Kael, just to let you know, we're not going to provide a translator. We're going to force you to do your trial in English. And I remember looking up thinking, oh my goodness, Akua is giving me this one. I'm telling you guys the truth. And I said, and I told her, I said, you guys are going to give me this? I mean, if I go to jail for speaking, it's so big, I ain't going to... You gonna give me this one? The girl, I can see her eyes crying. It's not coming from her. I show up to court the next time. There are two prosecutors now. This is a petty misdemeanor case. I get two prosecutors. Wait. 
I have two assistant chiefs of police in that courtroom for the next three days. What court cases of a petty misdemeanor charge have you ever seen assistant chiefs sitting in there? See, this is telling you how much they are afraid of us. They know. They see the writing on the wall. Because we got the truth no matter what they do. We got the truth and I know we got the heart. And so they said a hearing to, this, to the, the motion from the prosecutor which would say, I couldn't use Hawaiian in a court now. Now mind you, I've used Hawaiian many times before. In fact, many of you remember back in 2015, our court case, myself and Kawakahi and others used Hawaiian and got found not guilty eventually. This was nothing new. It wasn't a ploy. But they wanted to get me. Prosecutor, the young woman, makes her argument. My turn to argue my case. I stand up now. And I speak in Hawaiian for about 10, 15 minutes, arguing my defense without a translator. Now, mind you now, what you guys remember, like, the judge is going to decide whether or not I should have a translator. In other words, it was already decided before the actual hearing had occurred. This is how corrupt that system was. I could not believe. And so, in other words, my voice had nothing to do with the decision. Of course, what the judge decided was, yep, you got to use English, Mr. Kyle. And of course, what my response was, of course, was, oh, ole. <laughs> and that's what happened in that court case. You guys remember the following, this is 2018 January. The word spreads by that time. And I'm like, you going to give me this? Up to you, brother. Contempt of court. I'll go to contempt of court for speaking Hawaiian. Think you're going to intimidate us nowadays? You think this generation is going to ever allow you guys to tell us when we can use our olelo? Not this generation. And I know the ones that's coming is even more tougher and stronger. That's for sure. So I show up to court that day. And some of you might remember. I go in front. I see the bailiff who's my auntie. The other bailiff is my classmate. <laughs> Sit down. The judge stands up, calls my name. I stand up in Hawaiian and I say, kekune mamuo. Here I am, standing right in front of you, judge. He says, Oh, ah, I cannot understand what you're saying, Mr. Kaeo. <laughs> he says that. And since I cannot really affirm that that's really you, he told the bailiff to make three calls. My classmate, she looks at me, I'm looking at her. She goes, she goes outside, Samuel Kale Koa Kaeo. Samuel Kale, three times. I mean, it's crazy. I want you guys to understand, that's how crazy this stuff is. The people in the gallery are like, what the hell is going on? I've been in front of this judge at least 15 times. Not too much guys bowling head with a tattoo on their face. I mean, that's, this is how insane it is. They come back in and he says, and he turns to the prosecutor now, who knows me too. Uh, you affirm Mr. Kaeo hasn't responded, blah, blah, blah. We're going to put a bench warrant for his arrest. And I'm standing there going, for not appearing. Bang, bang, bang. Right, I go outside. I see the, the sheriffs and other police officers around there because I didn't even realize when I walked out there, I tell people, so I get emotional. Man, had the whole punanaleo, all the parents, all their singing with the flags. Because, you know, we're not alone. And I've been talking to the sheriffs. I said, well, I'm ready. They're like, Fuck. <laughs> the sheriffs are like, this is crazy. <laughs> the following day, of course, by that time, as I understand the story, Supreme Court judges called out and told that judge, hey, you, yeah, basically, you dumb and stupid in that decision. <laughs> and that got revoked. And eventually the trial started back again in May into the summer, January. But by that time, it already had expired in regards to the time, right to a speedy trial. And to me, one of the more important things that I did also in my argument for right to a speedy trial, wrote it all in, wrote them down this time, rewritten all in Hawaiian. So my filing, playing Konani with the judge, 
And so when a judge says, we're ready for trial. Yes, judge, ready for trial. Okay, let's start. Oh, excuse me, judge. I have a motion. Huh? Handing a motion in Hawaiian, and he looks at it. I mean, easy five minutes, just scratching his head. He never knew what to do. Because he could not move forward without dealing with that question of a right to a speedy trial. So he had to basically stop the case. Now he had to translate it and so forth. But for me, what is most important, I had forced the court to accept that dog, not just speak in Hawaii now, but to file in Hawaiian again. And I reminded the court to remember, the Second Circuit Court, its original language is in Hawaiian. English replaced it over time. There's no law that says you cannot use Hawaiian or file in Hawaiian. There's nothing there. But you see, if we think and we accept that they can define for us, Again, as a man think it, you see. If they can convince us and we go along, then they win. And eventually, because they had gone over the time limit, they had to dismiss all my charges. It is. Even better. But the point I'm trying to make about telling that story is don't be intimidated. If you know, you follow your na'au, and you know you're right, you fight it. You have to accept the consequences of that fight, but that's part of the fight. Because if we don't fight, they will continue to abuse us in that manner. And it's only by fighting back, resisting, that we can re, you know, re, uh, return Make those kinds of changes to better ourselves. But we add this to what's going on here. As we spoke about earlier. The reason why we are here for over 70 days is because of Kapu Aloha. It's because of how our kupuna have already showed us the way of what shall be done. How we shall behave. We must be disciplined. We must be willing to accept the discipline of this nonviolence and aloha, kapu aloha. We must have integrity in what we do as what you witnessed that day. The integrity of being kanaka to standing up for what is right. And I forget the third one already. Shocks my brain. I know it starts with a D. <laughs> well, come to me. But how we win is also as important as winning itself. Because this is about relaying that foundations for our people. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We have nothing to be afraid of. What we have is the opportunity to work together, join together, to see one another. You know, Kupuna have that saying, See your fellow kanaka, lest your aloha be wasted on the dog. We must see each other, kanaka to kanaka. That is the foundation of the lokahi, of working together and trust. Having that hilina in one another. We must see each other all as one lahui. And many of you heard I say, when people talk about, you know, kaleko, in which sovereign group you work with? Who's that? And I would say, only get one canoe. This is not a canoe race. This is not who get the biggest canoe. Only get one anyway. And once you realize only get one canoe, you got to work with everybody. We got to start paddling together. One, just start paddling. You start paddling, I'm going to say, oh, this is your rhythm. I'm going to start jumping in with you. Maybe we get about 12 steersmen back there now. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's part of the pinikia. Too much steers me, not enough paddlers. <laughs> but the synchronicity of moving together. We know. We know what it's going to take. It will take work. And that's the beauty of this place. That's the beauty of what's going on here. That's why I said, cry every day when I watch the ceremonies I participate. Watching the Lahui. From little Kiki to a Kupuna. Those who born and raised here in the heartlands of Keokaha, perhaps. To our fellow Kanaka from the diaspora who's been raised somewhere on the continent. And they all come. They all join in. 
Kanaka. Man, Kanaka. See, that's what they're also afraid of, I tell you. People ask me, oh, Kaliko, how come you work with those holy environmentalists? Because I know that's how we're going to win. But we got to get our stuff together first. But I know. United we stand. Divided we fall. And if our backs are oh, I can ask you, the on the wall. We'll be together. Together, you and I. I believe that. Working together. Standing together. Learning from one another. So you look at who we're fighting against. Same thing. They got their gang. They're getting paid well. They have a lot of financial interests to get us out of here. But in order for them to get us out of here, we know they have to manipulate us, get us off our game, make, make us forget our play, playbook. People say, hey, Kaliko, what are we going to do? What's the play? Kapoloa. That's the playbook. The kupuna, that's the playbook right there. Because to move us out of here, they will have to bring in a huge law enforcement, including the use potential of the National Guard that we know. Think about that. If they got to use the National Guard against Hawaii's own people. See, I study history. It never goes well for the government whenever they got to use their own military against their own people. It's never gone well for them. Because it exposes their weakness. That the only alternative they have is to use military and violent tactics against their own people. And that's why I always remind us, Kapolo is not just our engagement with them, but also amongst ourselves. And we're blessed in our situation to have our own brothers and sisters and cousins who are in law enforcement and in the National Guard. I tell you right now, and speaking to them myself personally, they are struggling with this. They don't want to do what they'll be forced to do. Even the National Guard. They know they're being set up. They know they're being used and pimped. They know it's their legacy. Who's going to be looked at as the bad guys? Them. Can you imagine, would you want to be on that side of history? I always say this. The, the problem with Ige and the TMT Corporation specifically is they don't, already, they don't know they're already lost. Because they can move every one of us right now. Think of the images. Seeing hundreds of our people taken out. Kapu Aloha. You think they're going to stop more people from coming up here? What, they're going to bring a hundred, they're going to post a hundred police officers here for the next ten years? Who's going to pay for them? And I, as I want, as many of you know, I'm a nerd. Yes, I am. Proud nerd myself. I study this stuff. And you realize in big, large, non-violent direct action movements, you know how much percentage of the people you really have to activate? Anybody know what the number is? They say 5%. That's it. 5% activated, committed will throw off the system. The new research say more like 3%. I'm pretty sure we get 3%. Because it's not the quantity to talk about the vote, the numbers, and they play this game. Again, try to confuse us. I tell you, it's not the number. It's the, not the quantity. It's the quality. It's the will of the people that's more important. Who is more willing to do whatever is necessary? And I think it's us. We are more willing. We are here over 70 days already. But we got to be clear. They will attempt. They've already attempted. Right? They tried to use one of our brothers thinking they can target him, pimp out his mind to target another brother to create through their provocation, perhaps even an instance of violence, which then would justify that kind of use of violence upon us. But these are our brothers. Too smart. They knew they were being set up. So the brother said, because they're being run here with the spirit of this place. And that's why we all got to think like that. When you see something going on, try to talk somebody down. De-escalate the situation. Anybody that maybe shouldn't be here, shouldn't be here. Especially if they're talking about violence. Or they're talking anything about, oh, this Kapu Aloha stuff. Which I've heard. 
or whatever they might be saying to create disunity. See, that's the point. Because our strength is our unity. Because it's from a unity, the glue of Kapu Aloha is going to hold this. And I'm not here to lose. I'm here to win. And this is just chapter one. And that is what they're most afraid of. Do you think we win this mountain and it all ends for us, Kanaka? We will never be the same again. And that's why I keep on saying, it doesn't matter what they do anymore. All that matters is what we do. And we're pulling. And we dance. And we educate one another. And we hang on tight. And it's our future. And like I said the other day, there is that va right there for us. The va is ready to go. The choice, of course, is are we ready to get on that va to go into the future and to sail just like our kupuna in the past. No different. No different. Picking up that paddle, just not paddling, in unison, working together. Hukilike. Imo. Mahalo aloha nui. <laughs> yeah.